Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. So when picking a Bible verse, I couldn't really decide. I wanted to do both my confirmation verse, um, but I didn't think that I could properly talk about it in the way that my pastor did. So I went and I went to my favorite book, which is First Peter, which is really weird because the First Peter talks only about like a lot of suffering and just really not fun stuff. But um, I finally found a verse that I really thought would I could talk about pro talk about properly. And given what happened a few minutes ago, I think it's a really good thing that I had picked this. Uh, the verse I picked was First Peter four twelve thir thir through thirteen, which is beloved. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which is taking taking place to test you, as though something strange or unusual were happening to you. But insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, keep on rejoicing, so that when his glory is revealed, you may rejoice with great joy. So what does this mean? Well, the idea of enjoying our suffering is really not a fun thing. Uh, why would we be happy that we're having a really bad time? The idea of it was written at the time where a lot of persecution was happening. And this verse was written by St. Peter, of course, who, glorious beard in this picture, but uh, First Peter was one of the people who, he wrote this, of course, but during the time he had been, especially soon after this was written, he had been in a city where a girl who was possessed by a demon was following him, and the girl could, because of this demon, she could tell the future, and thus had been in a slavery ring where two men had control and were using her to make money. Well, she was following him and yelling at him as they were walking throughout the street, and he got annoyed, as most people would if they had some random person yelling at them, uh, and did a sort of exorcism, I guess, kind of just yelled at the demon and he left her. Well, the guys got angry at that because that was their source of income, and they beat him up and had him thrown in jail. Well, uh, as strange as it is, when he was in jail, he just sang a lot of hymns, which I'm sure probably annoyed the rest of the people that were with him. It certainly would with me, but that's just my opinion. But it, it was like God didn't was kind of just being like, yo, Peter, run, because he caused an earthquake that opened all the cells and broke the shackles that were held, holding them. And of course, at the time, that would have the guard assumed that they had all gotten out, which would have gotten ki him killed, because that's your job as a guard is to keep the prisoners in, and well, do all, all he knew is that they, the doors were open, the shackles were gone, and they were out. Well, just as he was about to take his own life, Peter just yelled and said, hey, we're in here. And I'm sure you guys have seen that um, Pit of Misery commercial, the Dilly Dilly one. Well, it was kind of like that, where he went, he shut the door and put the shackles back on. Where he could have escaped, but he didn't. He accepted the suffering that he was having. And at the time, a lot of uh, bad things were happening to believers. Crucifixion being one of them, and that's actually how Peter was killed, which if you would look at your handout that I gave you, a lot of people associate the upside down cross with being the cross of Satan. It's annoying because whenever I go to Hot Topic to shop, a lot of that is brought in. And so I had to sit there and go, I don't want old people to think I'm a Satanist. So, yeah. The upside down cross is actually how Peter was crucified, as he did not want to be crucified in the exact same way as Christ did. So he was crucified on an upside down cross. The actual cross of Satan being the alchemical uh, sign for sulfur. So, yeah. Uh, if you would flip your thing back down, please. But crucifixion was a very common way of execution at the time. And it caused a lot of suffering with the people. And unfortunately, even today, a lot of this crucifixion and suffering is still going on with believers in the world. It doesn't happen here as much. But in other parts of the world, crucifixion is still a thing. Surprisingly. Thought we would have gotten past that. But uh, I would have shown an actual picture of crucifixion, but I couldn't find anything that would not cause a normal person to throw up. So I didn't think that was very 
a uh, good thing to do. But uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12 states, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. It's inevitable. You're going to have someone who questions you and doesn't like you because of your faith. It's going to happen. And it's a matter of knowing that that's going to happen. And I'm okay, I'm a pessimist, which I'm sure everyone knows who that what that means. You cannot always have good in your life. It can't happen. Because if you always have good in your life, then you're never going to be truly happy. You're never going to be able to go, you know what, I maybe my car got in a wreck, but you know what, I get a new car out of this. Or my phone fell in the pool. I get a new phone out of this. There has to be bad for there to be good in this world. And as a pessimist, I can I see that a lot. Like I I don't look at the world in a very positive sense all the time, but you can't do that because if everything in this world was good, then why would we need God? Why would we need anything? You know. And uh. In this book of, uh, I found in my personal library at home, Paul Brand, who was a missionary surgeon in India, wrote a book called The Gift of Pain. And in this book he stated, I have come to see that pain and pleasure come not to us not as opposites, but as Siamese twins strangely joined and intertwined. Nearly all of my memories of acute happiness in fact involve some element of pain and struggle. We need to not always feel happy. It's something we need. And to say that you're always happy is always going to be a lie, because none of us are always happy, no matter how you look on the outside. So whenever you, know, you think, why is God doing this to me? Why is, why is all of this happening to me? Uh, God, First Peter 1 through six through seven even states, which I'm summarizing this because the verse was actually quite long, God would never give you something he knows you cannot handle. He knows that for a fact you can get through it. And uh, then in second in first Corinthians ten thirteen, it states, uh, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Everything that is happening to you has happened to someone before, and I don't mean to downplay any of this. Some people handle it different than everyone, but you just have to pick yourself up, and especially as it did with God, his own father abandoned him. The feeling he felt on the cross could never be replicated, replicated by any of us, and unfortunately, that's just how life is. Life sucks, and that's just the gist of what I, I'm saying. But if it didn't, then would we truly be living? Thank you very much. Let's give her a round of applause.